we'll just wait for Bashani to go live and then I'll start. Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'm Shaila Patnaik, a senior consultant at Think Talent Services. This event is part of Talent Coven Connecting the Dots, a series of virtual events to bring together HR and line practitioners to learn and share perspectives with a larger corporate fraternity. Today we present event five creating a self-driven culture of continuous upskilling and learning. With us today are three stalwarts from the HR ecosphere. Sarika Pradhan comes with 20 years of experience in the industry with organizations like Murugappa and PWC. She is an HR leader in areas of talent management, organization development, and POSH, among others. Currently, she heads talent management and is the chairman for POSH at Wipro. Mahaprit Bilimoria brings in close to 18 years of experience in the industry. She has worked in a variety of corporate and business HR roles in the Tata Group and specializes in areas of leadership development, high potential talent, and performance management. Currently, she is general manager and head TAS, Tata Administrative Services, which is the Tata Group's flagship leadership development program of six decades. Moderating today's discussion is Dolon Mitra, VP of Customer Solutions at Think Talent. Dolon leads the content design and solutions stream at Think Talent. She specializes in leadership team facilitation, executive coaching and assessments. Prior to her consulting career, she has worked with organizations like Sapient, KPMG and Axtria. A few things to keep in mind as we begin. As we're using Zoom webinar, your video will be off and your mic will be on mute centrally. This is to minimize distraction, uh, distractions during the session. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, you can see the icon on your screen. We will keep 10 to 15 minutes after the discussion to pick these up. This session is also being recorded and is being live streamed on YouTube. You can also join in there if you wish. So Dolon, over to you. Thanks, thank you Shaila a lot for setting the context. And uh, welcome to all the guests who have joined in on the Zoom link or watching us through the uh, live streaming on uh, the YouTube. Um, saying that, I would like to really welcome Sarika and Mafrit. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, to everybody, uh, these are two very senior people from our fraternity who have deep domain in the area that we are going to discuss today as well as has a very established track record in the area of talent management and learning. So the topic that we are going to discuss today is creating self-driven culture of continuous upskilling and learning. Uh, Sarik and Mafrit, again, welcome. So I think the fact that we need to focus on continuous learning is almost becoming commonsensical, right? Uh, and, and we end up talking a lot about digital, but digital is just a small part of this. I think what we really need to focus on is this connected, iterative, continuous learning process, which really helps someone maneuver the present situation towards success, right? And uh, it has also been proven that companies which really focus on learning culture do very well in some of the business uh, indicators like uh, customer experience, uh, innovation, longevity, et cetera. Uh, so saying that, first, I would like to go to you, Sarika. I mean, Vipro is a logo that everybody loves to have uh, around them, associated with them, etc. And perhaps to a great extent is because of the focus that the organization has on learning. Right? So saying that, I would like to just uh, ask your views on how do you think organizations are really evolving and focusing around this entire aspect of continuous learning uh, focused on specifically upskilling and reskilling. Thanks, Dolon. So, Dolon, I'll pick it up from your sentence, which you said that it's no more a luxury, it's a necessity. How do we really build the culture of learning across the talent strata? And if you look at the customers, and I come from an IT industry, they expect us to demonstrate agility and speed. And it's not only one time during the year. Why? Because there are rapid changes, disruptions, newest technologies, which has actually made adaptation an imperative. And be it learning, be it unlearning, be it relearning, that's the heart of adaptation. 
and we have to stay relevant. We cannot really believe in one-time learning anymore to really focus on all those things which I have shared. So two examples I would like to give from the organization is when COVID came, the pandemic happened, we created in just two weeks e-COVID modules, the e-learning modules, because 99% of our people were working from home. The way, and we didn't push it. It was just a pull because they also thought that they need to know what are the rules and regulations of working from home, the work etiquettes, how do you stay positive? How do leaders display empathy to their employees? Because it was a complete culture change. And that has really helped us to make the entire learning landscape as a continuous learning, be it in terms of upskilling, which you talked about, be it in terms of reskilling, or be it in terms of continuous learning. Thanks a lot for that, Sarifa. And I think what I really, um, what resonated with me was it's not just information and knowledge. It was sharing of the entire ethos of how to behave, how to conduct yourself, focusing on aspects of empathy, continuity. I think that uh, attracts people to the medium and then you later on use that medium to share whatever information you can. I think that that, that was really, really important. Now, uh, coming to you, Mafred, I mean, needless to say, TAS has been a beacon for uh, focused intervention when it comes to uh, talent development, uh, leadership development, etc. Right. So, saying that, a little bit of twist from what uh, I was uh, connecting with Sarika on is that: Do you see this as a new phenomena, uh, this continuous learning process, or do you see that there is a huge focus now because of external reasons, or do you think that this has been a basic ecosystem in most of the organizations which have survived for a really, really long time? Thanks, Dolon. And uh, to start with, uh, wonderful to be part of this platform and with all of you. Uh, continuous learning, it's a fantastic uh, theme that we have selected for the discussion today. Uh, and coming back specifically to your question, I think it's uh, not so much a new age phenomenon that we're talking about. Uh, the need for continuous upskilling, relearning and learning has been embedded now for quite a few years. What I do see actually is a sea change in how this has been delivered over time by organizations. And as we go along, you know, uh, in the course of the duration today, uh, we'll talk about some of the examples that the Tata Group has actually, uh, some of the examples at the Tata Group. But in terms of the need, continuous learning uh, is not something which is very new now. Uh, the need has been established, embedded for quite a few years. Uh, no longer are the days when you know you had uh, you were nominated to just one or two marquee or big programs in the entire calendar year, but uh, there is a need for a regular, bite-sized, continuous, constant engagement when it comes to learning and and reskilling. Right. Sure. So, um, one particular area which really interests me is that uh, at early on this entire concept of learnability, which we were introduced to. You know, there were this pre and post assessment for a workshop, and there would always be this bunch of people who would always derive the maximum from those workshops. And then when you align it to other parts of the data, you'll realize that that really reflects to the learnability of the person. So uh, these were the people who would derive the maximum irrespective of the other people for whom actually the workshop was designed in the first place, right? So there is a lot of aspects in terms of mindset when we talk about learnability, looking at your mistakes as opportunities, asking pertinent feedback, really emulating behaviors of others who are displaying those kind of skills, right? So again, going back to you, Sarika, um, uh, how do you see organizations or what are the steps that organizations are taking to create this ownership in people or in individuals that you are responsible for your learning and please have a certain level of orientation towards your own learning. How are we uh, doing that in organizations nowadays? Beautiful question, Donald. And I always reflect when I go to office or start working that what should we do from an NND standpoint or a perspective in terms of really not apply the push strategy, but the pull strategy. So 
So I want to share an example of LinkedIn analytics, which we get every month from the LinkedIn team. 90,000 plus Wipro-ites have gone to LinkedIn learning platform and learn some of the other e-learning modules. We have not taken that as a platform. That means it shows that the penchant for learning amongst individuals. Right. And the learning has been in domain, the learning has been techno-functional, in technical areas, in behavioral. So it's a combination of both soft skills as well as hard skills. It was very interesting to see that even when I come back to my own organization's examples, which I shared with you, we have about 1,25,000 employees who have covered uh, six e-COVID modules, which we came out in, in the last three quarters. Okay. Very impressive figures. And we have been an organization where our focus was on instructor-led tra training. Mm -hmm. Now, to move to a virtual instructor-led training to what Mah Fritz said on the micro learning bytes to the e learning modules. As we speak, we have about 70 to 80,000 people who have really gone forward and learned the different modules which has been hosted in our new LMS system, which we call it as a we learn. But two important things we need to, what we can do, I shared from an LND perspective. But the two important parameters is are we really making learning, that continuous learning as part of our culture? Right. Is it becoming a habit? The right. way we get up in the morning and we brush our teeth, are we really coming to office and really parking ourselves one or two hours to learn? Right. The second one is, any. it's a change management process. How do you build your awareness? How do you build your desire? How do you really tell the employees what's in it for me from a knowledge perspective and keep on reinforcing it? And that can happen only when it comes from the CEO or the chairman of the organization. The impetus from the top is very important. And then it makes the functions life easier when from every angle, people think that learning is here to stay and the continuous learning is a journey. And then we bring in the tight linkage to the people processes. We bring in the tight linkage to the business strategy. That's the role of us. And how do we create frameworks to catalyze and reinforce the entire thing in terms of champions, in terms of collaborators, in terms of deep conversations, in terms of evangelists, many things we can do. And these are just few pointers and nuggets which I'm sharing with the larger team out here who has come from the meeting. So we can actually do lots of things in terms of process improvements. Right. Sure, thanks a lot, Sarika, for that. So Marfrit, coming to you, is that uh, TAS is a particular institute which has been there for a long time, right? So also in, in, in the organizations, as you see, how do you think this mindset for people has changed potentially from perhaps few years back or from perhaps when we started our careers to now? And how are organizations which already had established processes in place tweaking their systems to ensure that they are changing with the need of the time? you are on mute. Yeah. You know, it's largely a function of a few things, the way I see it, and the way we have uh, taken a perspective on, on leadership development and long-term learning. So it's more about, you know, showcasing to talent these days that the organization has a long-term view and a long-term line of sight on their development. Mm -hmm. And if you really go to see, that's ultimately what, you know, our talent expects out of us. Uh, mm -hmm. A great role, a challenging opportunities, opportunities to learn and grow. But if you can put forward in front of them a leadership development architecture, which is not just the immediate term, to not mm -hmm. to say that, you know, we are here to invest in your careers for the immediate term or the short term or maybe one or two or five years, but you can show a line of sight, which is 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. saying that at every career juncture, when one is moving from, let's say, middle to senior to top management, these are the development interventions or imperatives that we infuse into your journey. So showing them that longer term line of sight, 
Uh, the other one I feel, and that's something that we have attempted to do quite a lot now at the Tata Group, is frequent and constant uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. There is a huge power in continuous conversations with, right. with employees, with talent. Um, and ultimately, in terms of creating a mindset shift, you know, where people own their learning journeys. Mm -hmm. It's really about uh, everybody understanding first to start with what their innate and intrinsic aspirations are, what their interests are, the career trajectory that each one already is on, the mm -hmm. expertise area or the domain area that they are on, the gears they wish, wish to shift to, and ultimately a real solid uh, review and understanding of one's gaps. And when we come to the gaps, that's where I'd like to again highlight the power of conversations. Now, every organization has got formal methods where you have your annual review discussions, you provide platforms for 360 degree feedback, but sometimes you can get feedback and input from the immediate ecosystem, even if it is not very formal. Right. So right. encouraging people to be more inclusive, to ask, to gain feedback from team members, undoubtedly from their managers, peer to peer coaching, these are areas in which really it creates a shift in the mindset where learning is now not the responsibility of the organization alone, but learning is my responsibility. You know, I have catching up to do. And therefore, what are my gaps and how can I get on with it? Right. So, Marfred, I think you bring about a very important point, which is conversations. And, you know, uh, I think gradually people are realizing that conversations are not time consuming, but they're definitely attention consuming. I mean, more than the 15 minutes of conversation, I think a lot goes in the preparation as to what are you going to discuss? What are the concrete areas that you're going to really, really focus on? But one point that I, uh, if you could just add a little more flavor to it. So, for example, you mention this long term and leadership architecture. You know, we always keep on hearing about the, 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 the organization or the world is in flux. Everything is changing. People really don't know. People really need to manage with this continuum of uh, flux that we are surviving in. So in that, when you're talking about a time frame of 10, 15 years, having a visibility of 10, 15 years, how are you guys actually doing it? I mean, how are you being able to arrive at some structure which has a visibility of 10, 15 years in the present world that people have made it out to? Sure. So I'll throw a little light on, uh, you know, what I mentioned, what, which is the leadership development architecture right. for the PAS or for the Tata Group within. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a, a journey, which is almost a 10 to 15 year journey. So what we've really done is we call it a leadership life cycle framework, which mm -hmm. means taking a longer term view of a talent's career journey. So when one is moving from uh, senior to middle to uh, from middle to senior management, what are the necessary development interventions, programs and support that the talent needs to ready himself or herself for that next logical role or that next higher role and this right. comes in various forms so there are three pillars on which you know the framework really hinges mm -hmm. uh, one is the roles that people undertake so in the formative mm -hmm. years you undertake roles which give you functional depth which you set mm -hmm. your foundation in terms of understanding exactly how businesses work mm -hmm. as you move up uh, encouraging people to take up team lead roles and then moving on to business roles and uh, functional mm -hmm. head roles the next critical pillar which I want to highlight is the programs and interventions. Uh, right from, you know, having a three-tier leadership programs where at the formative years you are coaching people to be great individual contributors. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to imbibe leadership excellence, uh, mm -hmm. corporate excellence, moving on to being team leaders, uh, moving on to being uh, heads of functions and businesses. So be three-tier leadership programs. Another important uh, set over here is coaching and mentoring. Right. We do consider coaching and mentoring to be a huge enabler in helping talent realize their potential. Right. And these are one year journeys, coaching, mentoring journeys. And the good part here is that we take feedback from the learners themselves saying, mm -hmm. how would you like to see your one year coaching and mentoring journey pan out? What are mm -hmm. the initiatives and interventions that you want to be part of? And of course, right. there, is a, there is a repertoire of programs out there, whether it is digital learning, online learning assets, uh, you know, giving them access to publications, webinars, mm. podcasts, giving them access to uh, certifications. We allow them to choose as well what is it that they really want to be part of. Right. The, the long-term architecture is really uh, all about uh, the two things that I mentioned, which is roles, programs, interventions, 
and the thing that I prior mentioned, which was conversations, talent dialogue with the companies, coaching conversations, career conversations with learners, saying how is the role currently, you know, shaping up for you? Right. What is it that you see is something that you'd like to take on in your in, in the next two three years, and how would you like the organization to support you? So back again, the power of conversations. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot, Margaret, for that. I think that was really insightful. So, uh, sorry for coming to you. I think um, uh, the more we say about this entire topic of conversation is less. So, uh, we just know, I mean, I, I think Google did an extreme deep dive analysis of the middle management profile because that is a population that we have been thinking about. What is the impact? What are the value that they are bringing in? What are the things that we really need to focus to upskill them, etc.? And I think the sole thing that came out of um, researching some millions of uh, uh, people in that particular career stage is the most impactful thing that people can do at that career stage is to mentor and coach the people down below. And that came as the sole and the most important impact area for that particular career stage. So I, I think we, we, we cannot take away from the importance of conversations and real regular conversations. But saying that, I think the mindset that we spoke about, conversations, etc., it is important. But we cannot take away from the fact the kind of support that an organization also needs to provide in terms of repository of knowledge, network, leadership cover. And I think most important is the opportunity. You're making that person learn a lot of things great, but the person also needs to create that or make some output from whatever he or she has assimilated. So if I may ask you, uh, how would we or what is the best way of looking at learning interventions or this continuous learning support interventions at an individual team and at an organization level? Or maybe is there a need to look at it at three different levels to ensure that we are being able to really focus and give people what they want or what they need? Sorry, I could just... So Dulon, to your previous question, I missed giving an example and I had the live examples for each of the questions. So one is, I'll just take the example of our first time manager program, which is a platform based journey we have started over the last few years. So initially, we were going to our HR team, to our business leaders in the units and all for the nominations of these people. Who are your people you would want them to go through? Right now, after completing three, four batches, we have created a click where we are seeing about 2,500 people self-nominating themselves that they want to be aspiring FTMs. So for us, that has been a wonderful way of saying that people really want to own their own learning. I just wanted to share that yeah. example to, and a rejoinder to whatever Mahafrid talked about right. long-term intervention. Now coming to this question, I think what you have shared, Dolon, makes sense. And in large organizations like Wipro, Tata, until and unless we have this kind of a structure and a framework, we will go or I actually. So coming to the organization, yes, organization do play a big role, even though we say that the individual has to own his or her learning, more from the culture perspective. Mm -hmm. Means the smell of the place should be that the person is learning something. Right. And right. from the culture comes the purpose. Right. Why, why should people learn? What's the purpose of it? And then comes the changing minds. Only if the people at every uh, area band knows what's the purpose and what they should do, be it middle management, be it junior, be it senior. And from there, it helps us to innovate and retain the people. Now, if I move to the team level, at a team level, I think it is the demonstrated behaviors, which is very, very important for them to exhibit and how actually they meet or align with the business objectives. And then coming to the individual level, it is what's in it for me. Am I really performing to the level of excellence? If I am not, what are the actions I need to take for me to get the results desired from myself, from my manager, from my organization? So I, I will put it in this way, Dolan. 
And so, here uh, examples yeah. before you go to Mahakshay. One is the digital journey which we started. And like you rightly said at the beginning, it's just a subset of the overall continuous learning. But we know that if we, 1,90,000 workforce, are not knowing what digital is all about, yeah. that impetus and that imperative which we have built over the last five, six years on digital is humongous, actually. And uh, before, we were just going for one skill. Now we are saying that people should be multi-skill ready. Yeah. And for that, we have partnered with NASCOM mm. as an alliance where we have actually had a future skills ready. They have a lot of courses where our people can go and get themselves ready mm -hmm. to get available, right. to get productive. Right. Right. So um, Sarika, you made one particular point, uh, which was very interesting. I think we have received a question on that. The, the smell of the place, you, you use the specific word smell of the place, you know, smell, touch, sight, these are very feeling words and evokes a lot of uh, positive sentiments. So when you actually mention that word smell of the place, how do you do the small little things which really makes the smell even more sweeter? So what would be these really impactful but very less time consuming small things which makes a long lasting impact? Yeah, so I'll take the example of the FTM, which I shared again, the okay. first time manager, because if I take one initiative and then I will say how that stickiness or the glue has happened and which makes us very happy is, one is the platform-based journey where people yeah. go through the programs and we have a lot of interaction with our partners to really bring in the best of the facilitators and share with them the practical examples for them to replicate as managers to the teams below. Right. Besides that, we bring in a lot of leadership uh, perspectives from our organization who has been there, who has been consistent in their performances. And we also touch a lot of people processes during that time, that right. as a manager, how these are also very important. How do you really do a performance discussion? Be it a good discussion, be it a bad, not so good discussion. So each, each touch points helps you to understand, are you really making your first time manager holistic? And that really helps us to understand the smell of the place is positive or the smell of the place is going haywire. And I really need to sit inside the boardroom to decide my next course of action. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, Sarika. Thank you very much. So, uh, Manfred, coming to you, you know, there will be always this 20% of the population in organization who would know what to do. They will look for avenues of making themselves relevant. They will learn. They will find the right opportunities. And they will be your stars, right? But there will always be this good 60 or 80% population who would need your support. And the best part is the organization will be dependent on this large population to maneuver it in the right direction, right? So how as leaders or people in the learning functions, we really help people identify what should be their focus areas or what are the things that they should focus on in order to stay relevant in the industry or in the organization? Sure. Uh you rightly mentioned, you know, that there are this top 10 or 20% who are excessively, you know, well on their way, as we would call yeah. them. They're just yeah. well on their way. But there are those solid citizens who need who need that little guidance, I would say. It's not so much a push because today the good part is that we are realizing our employees, talent, uh, in-house uh, learners, uh, they do see the importance and the need for, uh, for upskilling and for... Uh... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mafrit, now we can't. Mafrit, can you hear us? Dhulna, I suggest you continue and then hopefully she'll join back. Sure, okay. 
So, uh, Sarika, as Mafred had already uh, started commenting on that, uh, the larger population who needs a little bit of support and guidance, what would be your uh, take on what would be the specific areas we should tell them or we should guide them? Or how does organization really guide these people onto what are the things that they need to do from their own learning journey perspective? There has to be, Dolan, a strong linkage, I think, with our performance management system. Mm -hmm. uh, and learning and development of an individual, irrespective of the person is a high potential, a consistent performer, or people who are solid citizens. Mm -hmm. Learning is a must till we go to our happy hunting grounds. Right. Right. So there are lots of things which we do, and we host it in our uh, LMS as well, in terms of what they can do themselves, what they need to come to the HR or LND for support mm -hmm. and what they can do from an external standpoint. Right. Right. In terms of webinars, in terms of certifications, because that involves a cost. Right. Right. So what we do in Wipro is uh, we believe in mentoring and coaching, which uh, Marfrid also talked about. Right. I mm. think the more we do, the less it is. Mm -hmm. How do we actually build a culture of mentoring mm -hmm. in our system? We mm -hmm. have a platform which is called as learning networks. But my point is we can really make it more effective. At one given point in time, do I have, say, 15,000 employees who are getting mentored by different men? Mm -hmm. The other things I talked about is the self-learning through micro-learning bytes, through e-learning modules. The third thing which we are trying to bring in, how do we move from episodal learning to a journey-based approach? Right. Because, right. because a problem has come from the managers mm -hmm. that people go for this program, they give a lot of appreciation. There has been a lot of instant learning. After a few days, they forget. Right. So how right. do we really move into a journey-based approach of five to six months journey where mm -hmm. we hold this cohort? Right, right, and we bring right. in a lot of elements and where actually this cohort not only learns from the program, but learns very holistically. Be right, right. to peer, be top to down, bottom to up. So the bubble, and another one is the bubble assignments, where besides doing the job, if you have one or two hours free every day, or say three, four hours in a week, can you really go to your interest area? So if mm -hmm. we handle, uh, we handle uh, initiatives like we bring in uh, global 100 hires to our organization, as well as about 200 plus uh, MBA hires from the previous institutes. Right, right. And as a team, we hold them for, uh, say, 18 to two years, 18 months to two years. Right. So we just ask them through our FGDs and lipstick surveys, Besides the work you are doing, you may be a business analyst, you may be in strategic marketing or HR. Right. Which are the passion areas where you want to learn? Right. So we right. want to learn about strategy, about mergers and acquisitions, about finance. Then we go to the leaders, the functional leaders, and we check with them. Do you mm -hmm. have some projects where right. you can do the stressed assignments, the bubble assignments? And because if you look at the 70 20 10 model, right. 70 percent is on the job right, right so every right. day for us we learn on the job and then right. we bring in the mentoring and the training intervention so right. those are the, right. and the very strong performance management conversations right. these are right. a few things which we do and sure. we go back to mafred i think she is back so uh, yeah we will uh, mafred good to have you back we will go back but just uh, Sarika, one particular point over there, you spoke about a lot of things, but one particular area which I feel sometimes get missed and is extremely strong tool is this peer-to-peer -peer coaching. And whenever you are talking about, for example, let's take first-time manager or manager of manager, there is an entire cohort which is going together, right? And there's a huge opportunity of creating very valuable content, which they're sharing with each other about how to resolve an issue, how to resolve a roadblock or whatever. And that's a very rich contextualized content for the organization. So how as an organization should we, number one, look at harnessing this entire peer-to-peer -peer coaching process, as well as look at creating content uh, from this peer-to-peer -peer conversations and uh, coaching processes. 
I think we have started it small, but we have miles to go. And now, like I said, from our episodal learning, we are moving to journey based where we are creating this cohorts dolon, be it right. for the manager of managers, be it for the FTMs. I think this is a brilliant concept where we really need to change the psyche and mindset of our human beings. Mm -hmm. Sarika mm -hmm. wanting to learn from Dolon or Mahaprid has to have an open mindset that yeah. they bring in a lot of inputs which you aren't aware of. Right. And there is a positive way of looking at it. Right. Once we open that and build the awareness and mm -hmm. then we can bring in the frameworks of peer to peer coaching. But yeah, you have given me a food for thought actually for the cohorts which we are going to build in future and current how do we really bring in as a formalized way of learning? Sure, sure. Thanks a lot. So, Mafred, good to have you back. So, uh, uh, continuing with that, just if I may add a little more flavor, uh, how do people stay ahead of the curve in terms of their learning? So, how do we enable them to give direction or pointers as to what do they really need to learn or develop to remain relevant as well as continue in their growth journey. How do we do that as an organization? Sure, and just want to check if you can hear me clearly. Sorry about the little glitch there. No, no worries at all. We can hear you and we can see you as well. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, so Dolan, I think it's really a function of uh, helping people understand what's out there. Right. So people are really, you know, uh, very focused on the job at hand, very focused on doing their best every day when they come into the office. Uh, people uh, on their own also gravitate towards understanding what's new age, what's changing uh, globally, within their industry, within their function. And it starts small and it goes, grows big. So it starts first with your own function. It starts with your organizational ecosystem. And then it moves out across to what's happening out there, you know, globally. But sometimes I have realized that they, they do uh, require the support and the engagement maybe of the HR teams, of the L&D teams, of their managers to really understand what are the new age themes, topics, areas that one really needs to catch up on. And that little introduction, that little nudge, that little support to say, hey, uh, these are some fantastic programs that you can embark on. Mm -hmm. These are some fantastic interventions that we see are relevant for you given the career juncture, the career trajectory you are at right now. And let me, let me take a few examples. Yeah. <clears throat> if it's, uh, you know, people who are moving from, let's say, a mid-management to a senior management role, mm -hmm. moving to a global role, uh, mm -hmm. supporting them with uh, programs around leadership uh, through different cultures, acclimatization yeah. across cultural boundaries, uh, these are some of the areas in which the organization helps identify them for them, identify right. these for them. Uh, let me take another example of uh, niche skills. Uh, mm -hmm. Niche skills could, you know, straddle across functions, straddle across industries. And no matter which function you are, which industry you belong to, it's agnostic. Mm -hmm. So niche skills would be things like design thinking, would be AI, art of storytelling. Yes. These are some areas I have realized that our talent needs that little support to understand what's out there. And if we can uh, not, I would not say give it to them in terms of spoon feeding, mm -hmm. but uh, introduce them to some of these areas, it really, really helps. Uh, so more often than not, I have seen it's just about opening doors and uh, people do have that intense uh, intrinsic motivation to then pick it up from there. Sure, sure. Yeah, you just give them a little bit of taste of the beautiful dish which is cooking and then they will just lap it up. Yeah. Uh, no, and if I, may add, if I may add to this, what then happens is this is just the first part of it. Yeah. Uh, for them to then come back to say, you know, yeah. taking, a, taking along from Sarika's point, which is the pull factor. Yeah. If you give them a flavor that learning can be fun, it can be experiential, it can be innovative, it can be different. Yeah. If you give them that flavor, they're going to keep coming back for more. And sure. whilst I say that, let me give you examples of what that fun could be. It could be teaching leadership through art and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a program for young task managers. And when I say young, they're really young. We're talking of just one year into the program. Okay. Before they move into their final roles with group companies, we do a program called Leadership Essentials and Corporate Excellence. And that is no longer delivered uh, through the team building and games, uh, you know, methodology. Mm -hmm. It's now delivered through theater and production. 
so you will have these group of youngsters who are part of role plays who are part of production and you know theater setups they've been given plays and plots uh, they need to kind of uh, choose who's going to be the hero in the role who's going to be the protagonist and through that you will see fantastic learning uh, and uh, leadership lessons that come out of it so if you can tell them that learning can be del- delivered through these forms they're going to keep coming back for more yeah absolutely absolutely I think, Manfred, you make a very, very relevant point, which is uh, being comfortable with the new. But the only thing which was coming to my mind is being comfortable with the new, accommodating the new. Does that also mean that there needs to be a certain level of unlearning? So, for example, I mean, if I give my particular case, about five, six years back, whenever I was think about a problem and need to find out a solution, the only thing is I would pick up a call and call up my batchmates, my colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. So believe me, from the last one, one and a half years, I've realized that more than that, I just need to perhaps go and post that in the groups which have people across the globe. And the kind of variety of options and suggestions which come is phenomenal. But it was an unlearning process that I cannot lift up the phone immediately and just instead go the other way around, right? And it took practice. And I, and I think research says that whatever you want to be good at it, please keep bombarding your brain with that same thing and you will automatically gravitate towards that. So my question is, what are the things that we really need to unlearn or perhaps potentially move away from as learners, as well as as professionals in the learning field to stay relevant and coherent in the present world. So Sarika, I mean, if I may just pose that question first to you and then I'll go to Mahafri. So again, I mean, just sorry to reiterate, both at the learner level and as well as professionals who are propagating learning in an organization, what are the things that we need to gradually move away from perhaps? I will take up the uh, people like us who are propagating the learning. our own example, like I have touched upon, primarily most of the organizations, we were so, so comfortable doing uh, classroom sessions. Yeah. To bring in this kind of e-learning modules or bring in this kind of digital uh, literacy, that this is going to be the future and to actually get across to 60 countries, a diversified workforce, sitting across the world or globe was a humongous task for us actually. So for us first to unlearn was, ILT is not only the lever of learning. Mm. Can we just go and see what are the other things which we can do? So if I take an example of my setup which happened in LATAM, say we have 3000 odd people and 90% of them, they speak the local language. And we are a team who only speak in English and our communication mode is in English. So what did we do? To really make it as a case study, there were eight HR people over there where we did a knowledge transfer and TTT to them. Mm. And we ensured that all our learnings really went to the 3000 people, though in the local language. Mm -hmm. And we kept a tracking mechanism Mm -hmm. because one is the ideation, one is the framework, but actually the excellence is met when you are having the execution rigor. And I'm a person who completely believes that it has to be execution, which makes it effective anywhere we are. And that was one thing where we as facilitators and consultants unlearned a lot of things during the journey actually. Right. One is we became aware that we can't paint the brush. We had to open up our minds and have an open mindset that right. yes, there is a solution. Let's come together as a team to know what the solution is. So that is the unlearning from people like us. I'll leave it to Mafrid to talk about the learners. Sure, sure. Mafrid, yes. Please proceed in terms of what you think would be some of the unlearning that uh, individuals would Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yeah. I think she has some technology problems. Uh, Afrit, can you hear us? 
So I, I can continue and close. Yeah, that. sure. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, from a learner perspective, I think the most important thing is you need to be self-aware. I think there is a question which has come from a participant as well. How do we keep ourselves relevant? Right. And one is, if people are joining in corporates, they need to evolve themselves as individuals, as leaders. So what is that mindset they need to change? How do we really focus on our own self-growth? Many a times what happens, Dolon, is people get very complacent in saying that I have done this, this, this certifications, I have learned this, this, this soft skills, I am done. Yeah. I have arrived. Yes. And they have a facade completely. Right, right. So over there, we need to tell them and that nudge which Mahafrid was talking about, right. that yes, you have done this, which is great at this point in time. But now if you have to move here, be it laterally, be it vertically, these are the things which you need to do. And that's where our journey of digital impetus actually started in the draw. And that's where this entire piece of continuous learning comes in. How do you remain inquisitive? How do you remain curious? Like I, I go to a lot of these diversity sessions where I yeah. See, what are these young minds talking about? People are so siloed into their space of work, sphere of work on technology, technology, coding, coding. Right. Ask them. Right. I'm just making fundamental questions about a little bit about what's happening in the economy, right. what's happening right. in the political scene. They are completely blank. Right. They are lost. Right. Why should we know that? We only yeah. know that we should only do coding. So that's when I have to, again, unlearn a lot of things. Sure, How do we sure. really get that holistic view for us to know that when we face a customer, when we face our managers, we are able to do those conversations. Right. Many a times our people fail because they don't know what to question. Focus on. Yeah. Focus yeah. on. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Sarika, just owing to the fact that I have you here and you come with a very rich posh experience, have you seen this orientation towards learning or continuous learning any different across genders or it's pretty much the same? I was just curious because, <laughs> because of, I had you in the panel. That's it. <laughs> I, I think learning is uh, gender neutral to be, mm -hmm. about, this is my personal point of view and experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there are different kinds of learning. So mm -hmm. if you ask me, I dabble into things practically and I think my learning is the most out of there. I have right. seen my team members who love reading a lot of books and they derive the learning from there. Some people are really the good orators and presentation. They keep talking, they keep hearing and they learn over there. I, I think learning is all pervasive and there is nothing like woman learns more or men are more intelligent. I will not agree to that. I love your last comment though. I really love it. But saying that, hi, uh, Mafrit, can you hear us now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. So if we could just continue where we left, do you, what would you think would be some of the areas where people uh, would have to unlearn, specifically focusing at the individual learner level, uh, the way the world is going? Yeah, and I was looking forward to answering that when I got knocked off again. But it's quite a favorite mm -hmm. question. Uh, you know, it's it's just one thing to my mind, uh, Dolon, and that is the belief or the fact, we need to unlearn the belief or the fact that somebody can no longer be a student or a curious child. Mm -hmm. We need to throw that thought out of the mind completely. So think about times when we were young, uh, mm -hmm. as children, asking questions mm -hmm. all the time, being curious wanting to know, a child uh, observes and absorbs like a sponge. Right, right. So the belief that that can no longer be possible, that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, along as we evolve as human beings, as we evolve as age goes by, the fact that we can no longer learn the way we learned before. Uh, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. something that mindset that we, that's exactly the point we need to unlearn and believe that this is possible. Believe that sure. we can go back into being a student for life. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, 
just drawing from there, one particular question which has come in, and I think I personally really like it. So how do you build long-term orientation in learners, particularly given that the world is looking for instant returns on time or efforts spent on learning? You know, um, as they always say, the time is getting, the world is getting broken into three minutes attention span. So three minutes I've invested, I need to get something back. Six minutes I've invested, I need to get something double back, you know. So how do you really bring about this long-term orientation in people who are so getting used to this intense, instant gratification? So, Mahfrit, why don't you go first and then I'll take this to Sarika. Uh, yeah, so the long-term orientation really is about, uh, I would like to, again, go back to the point I made around the line of sight and saying what's in it for you. And the what's in it for you is also something Sarika mentioned earlier on this right. session. Uh, when you are able to uh, talk to somebody and make them believe that what you are investing in today is right. something that's really going to pan out. Right. Uh, you know, the famous saying that it all adds up in the end. There are right. times when you don't understand why you are doing certain things, why you are part of a role, why has that project landed onto your table? Why mm -hmm. have you been pulled into a CFT for something that mm -hmm. is radically different from what, you know, your uh, belief, your intrinsic interests are, or mm -hmm. from, you know, where your path is headed. But the power and understanding that it mm -hmm. all adds up is somewhere we feel that, you know, the, the long-term perspective has to get embedded. Um, I do understand where at one hand, we're talking of a three minute attention span. And on the other hand, we're talking of long term perspective. So people want instant gratification. But there is also something called the power of stories. Mm -hmm. When we are able to uh, put forth to our talent certain success stories of people who've made it across roles, who've had very different diverse career trajectories, who've taken up various kinds of opportunities, and today are leading businesses, leading projects, uh, started with maybe finance and moved into marketing. Uh, yeah. These are great stories to tell and there are fantastic experiences around these. Yeah. So when you're able to uh, show that and recognize that these are some success stories that organizations have had, that people themselves have, you know, been fortunate to experience, that's when you're able to uh, leverage uh, the long-term value uh, that you want to put forth. Thanks, Manfred. So, Sarika, the question is looking at the kind of sector that you're also managing, right? This, I think this entire concept of instant gratification started from ITITS, the quick, fast pace, etc. So, coming specifically from that background, how do you really build in this long-term perspective of learning and career journey in instant gratification? Because over here, people look, don't just forget about learning. They look at, I am looking at learning this tool. That's it which is going to be relevant for the next six months and nothing beyond. So from there, I mean, so difficult it would be to really, uh, from your perspective, to establish a long-term perspective. So how do you go about doing that? So you are right, no, no. This instant gratification is something which we oft use it in our uh, organizations. My only point is, yes, there are uh, customers who will come back and say that we need an immediate result from this uh, people who are working in our accounts. In terms of a tool, in terms of a certification, it's easier said than done. You just put them, they do it, and they come back. But say, if I take a, an example of communication, right. we bring in 15,000 people every year from 250 uh, engineering colleges right. and it's not only the tier one cities we go to tier two yeah. three four where uh, the diction the accent the pedigree they come from they may be technically savvy but communication is not a strength for them and do you think when they come to our organization basis of induction we cover communication can they change overnight can we give an no. instant gratification to their managers and all? It's a catch-22 situation. It depends on the talent which has brought in. So for us, communication plays a big pillar in Wipro, where as a journey-based approach, we keep on doing communication programs in different styles uh, to the employees so that we make them at least ready. If they are one on five, can we just bring them to three on five in a one year span? Because we all are matured adults now. We are not those kids, which Mahapri talked about, who absorb and they are like sponge, right? For them also, it's very difficult. 
we keep on trying. But I want to give an analogy to loan out here on mm-hmm. that instant gratification. And the analogy here is meditation. The so last one year, uh, I think I have not missed one day even when you are not well, when you are quite well, I have done a 10 minutes meditation. Mm-hmm. You tell people, they understand the benefits of meditation. And one day they do along with you the 10 minutes guided meditation. Mm-hmm. That day they just feel good. Mm-hmm. But when you do it as a habit for the last one year, and I'm just giving my own example. Now when I reflect back, I can see the clarity of thought, mm-hmm. the sortedness you feel while you are doing your work in terms of your calendar in terms of what you need to do in terms of prioritization and that's a very intangible feeling and benefits you get right. even right. though even though organization customers expect instant gratification if we as a uh, function or we as an organization go and tell them that we are in the right direction we have the right spirit embedded but for this things it will require one month for these things, two months for these things, 12 months. Once we make it very clear and there is a collaboration and connectedness uh, between the stakeholders, I think the ecosystem will be very bright. Right, absolutely. I think drawing from what you said, Sarika, and also what you said, Mahafred, I think it's very critical to build that larger perspective, what you are really deriving at. So at this point in time, there may be some confusion or some lack of clarity, but I think there should be complete focus on what you are headed at. What is your final aim or what is your final goal? And once you have that clear picture, I think the process or the road also becomes clearer. So saying that, uh, Mahfred, we are almost coming to the end of the session, though it was really enjoyable talking to both of you. So saying that, just can you give us few uh, practical examples that you've seen either in your your organization or elsewhere on how they have really embedded this entire concept of continuous learning in their organization and in their people. Sure. So the first thing uh, I'll start off with uh, Dolon is uh, how learning has been delivered and the changing aspects of that. And it's not just because of the pandemic or the, you know, last one year has forced us to change the way we do things, but even prior to that. So moving from (laughs) in-person to to digital and virtual learning, uh, you mentioned rightly that, you know, attention spans have gone down. So putting before the entire talent community an entire repertoire of digital learning assets, and that's something we have done. So whether it means signing up with Harvard Spark or signing up with Coursera or Udemy, uh, having some of our own internal programs being digitally uh, delivered, that's something we have done. Uh, and let me just take another example. It's ju- also from a two-month uh, induction program, which we would otherwise have in person, where people travel to flagship establishments of the Tata Group. That is now also being done digitally, all the way to our marquee leadership programs, which is our three-tier leadership program. Some things like personality profiling, coaching, mentoring, that has also been completely revolutionized and delivered in a digital format. So that's that's an instant one. Uh, I mentioned earlier also learning, which has been converted into fun learning. So different right. methodologies over there where we moved from uh, just, you know, having team building exercises to having more uh, learning through quizzes, learning through mm-hmm. competitions. And it's mm-hmm. really fun to see how people get extremely involved and they put their whole selves into mm-hmm. the learning agenda when you have uh, it interspersed with this kind of fun activity. So that's that's a focus that we have we have been giving quite a bit. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Malfred, for that. And I think the lasting thing is, well, whatever you do, things cannot be made too serious. Then completely somewhere down the line, it just loses its impact and efficacy. Absolutely. So Sarika, if you could just run us through some of the really, uh, what do you say, impactful things that have stayed with you from either your organization or elsewhere uh, on this area. So I think whatever Mahaprit said, we do the, almost the similar things uh, in Wipro. And I had given you the example of uh, COVID e-modules where we really stood up as a function and uh, showed it to the entire Wipro world that we can make it happen. And we not only made it happen, 
we had that execution trigger and we ensured that across the globe people attended. So that was a massive shift which we brought in in our L&D space. The other thing where I talked about the Wipro NASCOM, like that okay. we have a lot of partnerships with universities and academias. Like our engineering team has it with the IISC in Bangalore. So those really helps us to bring in the cutting edge technologies and that we also focus a lot. And the third one is I would really uh, share my heartfelt thanks, not only to Think Talent, but people like you, Bimal and Dolon, where during this time, more so in the new normal, you have come out and across the social media channels, the amazing work you were doing in terms of unlearning, relearning, and learning. That was another example which I wanted to share, actually. I think these are the different kinds, levers, pillars, which really makes learning so very special. Thanks a lot, Sarika. And I think um, what you mentioned about us, I mean, getting uh, reassurance from people like you really makes us feel that we are in the right direction. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you very much. So um, we are almost at the end. While I am with you, Sarika, any last thoughts uh, on this entire topic, how the world is progressing and where is it going in this area? So I had three, four quotes, which are, I, I love sharing quotes actually, don't want to the entire participants out here. And whatever you have asked us the questions and whatever we have shared with our knowledge and perspectives, both me and Martin, I think change is the only constant to stay relevant. Right. Irrespective of you are an individual contributor, you are a manager, or you are a leader. Right. You don't change, you are gone. You become redundant. The second one I wanted to say is, Rome was not built in a day. Yeah. And my favorite quote for which I'm known in Wipro is uh, my team. I think few of them are here in the call. Miles to go before we sleep. So don't take the accolades and sit down that you have done a good job. We still have to go far. And at the end, I want to just close it as leaders need to do the walk the talk. And as a leader, I believe in it wholeheartedly. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot, Sarika. I think that was a beautiful way in which you brought everything together. Now, if we could just come to you, Muff, with your views, your parting thoughts. Sure, Dolon. Uh, so the first one that, you know, I'd really like to talk about is that uh, organizations uh, really have the wherewithal today in terms of uh, resources and in terms of, you know, uh, knowing what's out there. But uh, there is only as much as the organization can do in terms of providing platforms, opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, opening doors, making introductions, uh, going down to even hand-holding talent today uh, to understand and identify their areas of, uh, you know, their areas of uh, skills that they need to work on. Uh, but beyond that, it really is up to each one of us as, mm -hmm. as a learner, as a child, as a professional, as an individual uh, to participate wholeheartedly uh, and very sincerely, I would say, in our own learning and growth journey. So the accountability ultimately comes back to each individual. So that's a thought I want to leave out there. And uh, another message that I'd like to tell everybody who's watching today is that when you really go on to doing something that you really haven't done before or learning a new area, and that skill could not could be a skill which is outside of the professional realm. It need not be a skill or a competence or a leadership attribute. It could be learning a musical instrument for all I can say. It could be learning a new language. But when you go out there and you make it happen for yourself, there is a huge amount of confidence building that you do for, your, for oneself and for your own self. Mm -hmm. And uh, evolution as a person, I would say, experiences that we gain by learning new skills uh, helps us evolve as a person. And a byproduct of that then is, you know, becoming a great leader, a great manager, a great professional. Mm -hmm. So focus on evolving as an individual and gaining crucible experiences is, is my message to everyone today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marfred. I think thank you, Sarika, and thanks, Marfred, a lot. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I'm sure everybody who has logged in or who going to see this YouTube is going to find it extremely useful, practical, and impactful. I, I think it was an extremely enjoyable experience for me. 
I think a few last thoughts that you mentioned, which really resonates. Number one is we should really look at evolving as individuals rather than focusing on specifically our work. And that is the way the organizations as well as the world is going. And very rightly, as Sarika, as you said, miles to go before we sleep. So we are, we are all there in the same journey. And I'm sure very soon we will be reaching there, whatever we are targeting at. Thank you very much again. And um, thank you again for joining. Thank us. you so much. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Good day. Bye.